on if you'd like. Uh, so uh, greetings, everyone. I'm just going to quickly call us to order here. Uh, as I've mentioned just now, um, uh, the, what we're going to do today is we're going to have Prof. Terry Saka, who is our uh, president of the uh, um, St. Augustine College, South Africa. She's going to give a word of welcome and invitation to uh, Sister Elizabeth Johnson. And then afterward, uh, Sister Judith Coyle, who is our um, um, HOD in theology. Uh, she will give a word of thanks and appreciation um, uh, to, the, um, um, to Sister Elizabeth Johnson. Afterward, we'll have one of our own students, uh, um, Koda Makaba, who recently passed her, um, her mini dissertation with, uh, um, with flying colors. And uh, we can't wait to see her um, walk across the aisle and hopefully uh, become a big member of our, our community here. Uh, she will give a, a 25 to 30 minute um, um, response to um, Sister Elizabeth Johnson's paper, looking at how um, Elizabeth Johnson's theology as a whole, particularly her Trinitarian theology and her Christology, which plays a part in her pr presentation today, how it can um, be integrated within African theological contexts. Uh, afterward, we'll open it up for general Q&A until about 8 p.m. Uh, but I'm thinking about 30 minutes of Q&A. I'll play a little bit of Traffic Cop. Um, please raise your hand um, and I'll just keep track of who's had, who has their hand raised and we'll go from there. But for now, um, uh, Prof. Terry Sacco, you, you have the floor. Please uh, start us off. I'm delighted to welcome you to St. Augustine College's first postgraduate symposium for 2023, for which Dr. Justin Sands is the kingpin. I see here that I have many of my sisters, my Dominican sisters are here and I'm delighted with that. And my other sisters within the feminist movement and within um, the movement of pushing boundaries, I'm also very happy to have my brothers here who are present from around the world. It gives me great joy to welcome Elizabeth Johnson into our St. Augustine College community of students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends all over the globe. This is not her first connection with South Africa. Elizabeth was here for six weeks in 1987 at the heart of our anti-apartheid movement in this country. She taught a theological winter school at six different locations throughout Southern Africa with Father Larry Kaufman. The topic was Waves of Renewal in Christology, and this was later published in Consider Jesus, Waves of Renewal in Christology. Elizabeth, our sister Elizabeth, is a oh, member she of is. the Sisters of the Johnson. Joseph of Brentworth. I can't hear you. Oh, God. And distinguished pr professor emerita of the theology department at Fordham, a Jesuit university in New York City. Um, uh, Terry, you're, 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 you got muted there. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you for that. I'm sorry. There were some others that didn't put the, um, the sound off. So it, it, it was a bit, um, disturbing to me, but thank you for that. Justin. She served as president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, as well as the American Theological Society. She was the first woman to earn a PhD in theology from the Catholic University of America. And I think this is a round of applause for all of us who have been pushing the boundaries for women. A round of applause for you. Um, she is a recipient of 14 honorary degrees and the author of 10 books and over 100 articles. Among her, her books, the most prominent are She Who Is, The Mystery of God in Feminist Theological Discourse, Ask the Beasts, Darwin and God of Love, and Truly Our Sister, a Theology of Mary in the Communion of Saints. Her most recent oeuvre is Creation and the Cross, the mercy of God for a planet in peril. Perhaps the most notorious book might be Questing for the Loving God, 
mapping frontiers in the theology of God, for which she earned strong rebuke from the U.S. Bishops Theological Committee. The National Catholic Reporter said Elizabeth was one of the country's most prominent and respected theologians, and the New York spoke, Times spoke of her as a highly respected theologian whose books are widely used in, in theology classes. We know that she is a treasure for feminists um, around the world and theologians around the world, and she's gifting us with a multiplicity of voices, insights, and her unique wisdom. Elizabeth herself once said that she wanted to use the power of her mind to the service of people's faith for the good of the church and the world. Elizabeth, truly our sister, we are honored. As we welcome Elizabeth to share of herself with us, May we focus our beings, our energy, our thoughts, and our senses on questing for the truth of a loving, living, enfolding divine presence that lives and breathes through and among us. Elizabeth, you are welcome. Justin, you are muted. Justin, you are muted. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, you're muted. I'm sorry. There's a little button here on the bottom left. It looks like a microphone. You see, like the little bar here at the. Um... Okay, so like right here. Let me sh share my screen. Okay, so if you look at your screen, you'll see. Um, a few options at the bottom, right? So you'll see one that looks like a microphone and it says turn microphone on, on and off. So you'll see like right there. So if you can click on this button right here. Um, do you see it? Can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing it? So like right here, could you see, um, could you click on this button, Elizabeth? Okay, so you see where the leave call button is? It's on the exact opposite side. She's got it. She's got it. Perfect. Okay. Yes. All right. Good. The floor is yours, please. Go right ahead. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. I thought you, you had said that Judy uh, Coyle was going to also uh, say something mm -hmm. at the beginning. But no, all right, fine. I'm ready. <laughs> just, just stop sharing. Right. Just stop sharing, Just. I will. Yeah, okay. um, 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 Sister Judy will do so after your speech. I see. I'm sorry. I didn't follow that. No problem. So, um, wonderful. So, hello, everyone. Uh, from a winter day here in New York, uh, it's wonderful to be with you at this postgraduate symposium at St. Augustine's College. I thank Dr. T Justin Sands for his gracious invitation and Terry Sacco for that beautiful introduction. I'd like to begin with a story that highlights the main idea of this lecture. It appears in a novel by the American writer James Mishner entitled The Source. As he tells it, in pre-biblical days, people in a Canaanite village in Palestine worshipped a god who required human sacrifice including the lives of firstborn sons, which in return would ensure the fertility of crops. A young woman, Timna, has recently given birth. In love with her new baby, she cannot accept that he must die. Desperately, she pleads with her husband, she protests, she argues vigorously. 
but to no avail. On a given day, amid much public ceremony, her husband walks to the altar and hands the infant over to the priests who tumble the little bundle into the flames. Days later, still consumed with grief beyond words, she comes to a painful realization. With a different God, my husband would be a different man. With a different God, my husband would be a different man. The spiritual wisdom in this fictional woman's insight is profound. While never denying that God created the whole world and all its creatures, Christian teaching for most of its history has focused mainly on God's redeeming care for human beings. And the natural world formed simply a backdrop to the drama of human salvation. Given the current level of ecological devastation, this focus is no longer adequate. We need to wake up to the beautiful truth that the God we believe in created a community of creation of which we humans are a part and that this God is passionately in love with the whole shebang, as the saying goes. So the first words of this lecture's title are enfolded with affection, enfolded with affection. These words are taken from Laudato Si, which, as you know, is an encyclical written in 2015 by Pope Francis and entitled Care for Our Common Home. At one point, Francis quotes the biblical book of wisdom, which says of God, for you love all things that exist and detest none of the things that you have made for you would not have made anything if you had hated it." End of the quote. Now, pushing this idea forward, Francis reflects, quote, even the fleeting life of the least of these beings is the object of God's love, and in its few seconds of existence, God enfolds it with affection. Now, commentators note that the Pope may well have been thinking of the insect known as mayflies. After they hatch, these little insects live for only a few hours, during which they must find a mate and lay eggs to provide for the next generation, and then they die. So ephemeral, but enfolded with God's affection and loving care, as are we all. So imagine if we Christians had a continuous public understanding of the living God as a compassionate lover and redeemer of the earth and all its creatures, human beings included. With a different God, the people of God, the church, would be a different people. Our sense of our own human identity would shift. The second part of this lecture's title is We, Our, Us. So ask yourself, what comes to mind when you say the pronouns we, our, and us? What do you hear and think of when these pronouns are used in preaching and teaching, reading and writing, and especially in praying? Most likely, you imagine human beings, we the people, but this is way too narrow. If God enfolds even tiny little bugs with affection, then we need to do the same. And our minds need to see all living things as our kin. And our hearts need to feel connected to them as brothers and sisters, as fellow creatures. So that when we say in the Psalm, we praise you, O God, it's not only we humans, but all creation praises the one who made us all. And when we say in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, all creatures need to eat 
and look to God for their food. As Psalm 104 puts it, quote, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. So we, our, us. Can you imagine yourself as part of a bigger community of creation? Can we all do that so that these pronouns grow bigger and more inclusive? The result will be that love of the earth will flow as an intrinsic part of our love of God. And action on behalf of echo justice will flow along with action on behalf of social justice. This is the conversion that we are urgently called to as climate change brought about by human action causes severe disruption, as you know. Drought, wildfires, ferocious storms and floods, natural habitats disappearing, gross pollution, depletion of natural resources and fresh water, all leading to disease and death for human beings, especially poor people, and the extinction of thousands of species of plants and animals. But once we see that all living beings form one beloved community of creation, then loving our neighbor and action on behalf of justice will flow to protect the lives of all species, humankind and other kind together. I digress from my text here for one minute to say, it frustrates me no end when I give lectures on this to have people respond and say, well, we'll do that, like add it to the list. You know, it's, it's an add on, it's extrinsic. It doesn't come out of the heart of faith. No, that's not sufficient. So in this lecture, I would like to explore this challenge in the proverbial three points. First, a huge obstacle that prevents us from embracing such inclusive love. Second, how Jesus Christ factors in. And third, more briefly, the call to conversion to the earth that will move us forward. And let me say, I offer these probes into an ecological theology, not with the expectation that you will necessarily agree with everything, as in the hope that they will stimulate your own thinking about the sacred importance of the natural world. So first, what hinders us? To begin with something positive, consider this. In tune with other great monotheistic faiths, Christianity holds dear the belief that the one God created the whole world. The Spirit of God, the creator spirit, continues to dwell within the world, sustaining and empowering all creatures. That's a given. It's a core belief of our faith. So from a God's eye point of view, human beings do not stand alone as the end all and be all of the world but together with other creatures in diverse ecosystems, we all form one beloved creation. Think back to Genesis chapter one. In dramatic scenarios, the creator adorns the sea, the sky and the land by creating swarms of animals of every kind, a phrase that keeps repeating and it indicates vast biodiversity. As the nature writer Annie Dillard says, the creator loves pizzazz. And then speaking directly to the birds and the fishes, the creator blesses them, gives them the vocational charge to increase and multiply. Let's have more of your kind and sees that they are good. Note that there is a dynamic ongoing relationship between God and animals long before human beings appear on the scene. And the intimacy of this relationship comes to expression in Psalm 50, which tells of the broad divine knowledge and deep affection God has for animals. And I quote, for every wild animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the air and all that moves in the field is mine. 
Now, when on the last day humans are created, they are given the charge to take care of all this gorgeous life in the name of God whom they represent. This is the meaning of have dominion, does not mean permission to exploit, does not mean domination. It means represent God in seeing that all other creatures flourish. So there is only one beautiful community of creation. And it is one of the blessings of our era that scientific study using its own methods reaches the same conclusion. According to the scientific view, planet Earth, along with the sun and other planets of our solar system, coalesced from dust and gas left by ancient exploding stars, which themselves formed in the flaring fourth of the universe in the Big Bang. And then three and a half billion years ago, life ignited on planet Earth. Subsequently, evolution has brought forth what Charles Darwin beautifully called endless forms most beautiful, including right recently Homo sapiens on the primate branch of the tree of life in Africa. So in a biological sense, being related to all other living beings is encoded into the genetic makeup of human beings. In fact, all living creatures share a certain percentage of DNA inherited from our first ancestors in the ancient seas. Another example, human blood is red, as is the blood of other animals, because of hemoglobin, which contains iron, which was forged in those exploding stars and entered into the crust of the earth when it formed, from which we have evolved. The landscape of our imagination expands when we realize that human connection to other living beings is so deep that we can no longer define a human being without including the great sweep of cosmic development and our shared genetic inheritance with all organisms in the biosphere. So according to science, as well as religious faith in God the creator, there is one community of life on this planet. Everything is connected to everything else and it all flourishes or withers together. I ask myself, why is it so hard to see this? to feel this existentially. Why is being part of a splendid community enfolded with divine affection, not the default position of the praying church? Why is it so absent from our preaching and teaching to say nothing of religious practice and public advocacy? One very old factor that influenced how this happened still has staying power. This is a version of ancient Greek philosophy, which sees the world composed of two realities, spirit and matter. And it prizes spirit over matter because the divine is spirit. And so they figured things composed of more spirit are closer to God and therefore more valuable. Now, for centuries, theology drew on this philosophy to present a picture of the world structured according to what is called the hierarchy of being. The hierarchy of being. Now, at the bottom are non-living materials, such as rocks. They're just matter. Higher up are plants. They are alive. They respond to the sun. They generate seeds, so they have a little bit of spirit. Higher than them are the animals, because they have locomotion. Higher still are human beings, because we have a rational soul, as well as a body, a mind, intelligent mind, and a free will, so therefore a lot more spirit. And above us are the angels, who are pure spirits, who happily, in this philosophy, have no body at all. So as I sometimes have said to my students, it goes from the pebble to the peach, to the poodle, to the person, to the principalities and powers, all under the rule of the primary cause. 
Now, instead of a community of creation, instead of a circle of kinship, this teaching models the world as a pyramid with human beings at the pinnacle. And drawing on this schema, church teaching held for centuries that animals and plants, because they ranked lower than human beings in the hierarchy of being, were made for human use. In technical terms, they had instrumental rather than intrinsic value in God's eyes. Just note those words. Instrumental value rather than intrinsic. They're meant for our use. Consequently, as Thomas Aquinas reasoned, using this philosophy, at the end of the world, plants and animals will disappear. Since their purpose is to provide for our needs, once human life on earth is over, we no longer need them for food, clothing, shelter, and so on. Then their goal would be fulfilled and they would cease to exist. Now in the hierarchy of being, humans rule by right over the rest of nature. Today, feminist thinkers complexify this picture by noting how the hierarchy of being also divides and ranks the human race itself because it identifies women with the natural world, with Mother Earth, because of the life-giving powers of women's bodies. And it defines both women and the Earth to be subordinate to elite men, who by virtue of their innate power of reasoning are superior and are equipped to rule. Or so they said. Now this hierarchy of being with elite humans at the pinnacle turned really vicious in the 15th and 16th centuries when the European age of exploration began. Then thinkers in that aggressive entrepreneurial culture appealed to human superiority to argue that explorers had the right to exploit the minerals, the forests, and the animals in other lands for the profit of their king. And not to be missed is the way that elite peoples also applied this mandate to have dominion over others to other human beings. White Europeans thought they had the right to dominate and even enslave darker indigenous peoples whose spirits were of lesser quality or may be missing altogether, or so they said. Most Christian theology supported this view and its devastating practices for a long time. I find it daunting to realize how deeply this anthropology of the elite human being, preferably male, preferably white, has shaped Christian belief and practice. Not only has it prevented equality and justice in the human community, but with its conviction that humans are masters and rulers of nature, it has also opened the door to centuries of unbridled exploitation of nature without protest from the churches until quite recently. Now in strong language, Laudato Si criticizes this humans at the pinnacle view as quote, inadequate and frankly wrong. Pope Francis recognizes that he is contributing something new to Catholic teaching when he insists, quote, we are called to recognize that other living beings have a value of their own in God's eyes. And then redefining what church doctrine had assessed as of lower worth, he continues forthrightly, and I quote, in our time, the church does not simply state that other creatures are subordinate to the good of human beings, as if they had no worth in themselves and can be treated as we wish. Rather, they have an intrinsic value in God's eyes, independent of their usefulness to us. And why? Because God loves them and enfolds even the smallest with affection. 
In summing up this section of the encyclical, Francis teaches, quote, <clears throat> the final purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us. Rather, all creatures are moving forward with us and through us toward a common point of arrival, which is God. Do you see what went on here? The whole hierarchy of being is being dismantled. We human beings do not stand alone as subjects of divine love. Together with all other creatures in their diverse ecosystems, we humans form with them, and this is the quote, one splendid universal communion. Now, let it be noted that in no way does this teaching deny human distinctiveness, which is part of the glory and the misery of the world. But the great truth making human grandeur even possible is that we humans are creatures and precisely as created by God, precisely the fact that we are all creatures receiving our existence from God means we have more in common with other creatures than what separates us. Now you may want to argue that point in the Q&A, but I'm arguing that as creatures, we have more in common with other living beings than we have that differentiates us. So humans at the apex of a pyramid? No. Think circle of life. Us over them? No. Think we, our, us. In our beautiful, terrible, fragile, and vulnerable lives, we all share the fundamental identity of belonging to the same generous God and our kin in the one community of life. If we really believed this, care for the earth would flow as an essential part of Christian life, not something that we just add on and get to now and then. If we saw God enfolding all of earth with affection, we would have a different God than the hierarchy of being gives us. And with a different God, Christians would be a different people. So to move to the second point, at this stage of the lecture, theology asks specifically, what does Jesus Christ have to do with any of this? If the answer is not much, then what I have been saying about all creation remains on the periphery because Jesus Christ is central to Christian faith. So at the heart of belief in Christ, though, there is a powerful magnet pulling all creation into the picture. Recall how John's Gospel announces that in Christ, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And from this grew the doctrine of incarnation, in meaning into, and carne meaning flesh. Incarnation is the belief, wildly radical on the face of it, that in Jesus Christ, God entered into earthly life as an enfleshed participant with a personal life and a death. God joined our mess, as one of my students put it. Now, for centuries, Western theology confined the meaning of incarnation to God becoming human flesh, unlike scripture and unlike Eastern Christian theology, which sees flesh encompassing all living flesh, indeed, the whole material of the cosmos itself. Today, Western theology is moving toward that ecological view, thanks to the idea of deep incarnation. Deep incarnation, first proposed by the Danish theologian Niels Gregersen. Now, deep incarnation realizes that when the word became flesh in Jesus, the word of God united not only with human flesh, but with all flesh, beautiful and mortal, with which human flesh is interrelated. To quote Gregerson, in Christ, God enters into the biological tissue of creation 
in order to share the fate of biological existence. In the incarnate one, God shares the life conditions of foxes and sparrows, grass and trees, soil and moisture, end quote. And the reasoning runs like this. As a creature of earth, a human being on earth, Jesus was a complex living unit in the carbon and oxygen cycles. The atoms comprising his body were once part of other creatures. The genetic structure of the cells in his body were kin to the flowers, the fish, the frogs, the finches, the foxes, the whole community of life that descended from common ancestors in the ancient seas. The word became DNA, we might say. So the incarnate Christ is united to the whole evolving biological world of living creatures and the cosmic dust of which we are composed. That is why what Jesus does and says reveals the heart of God. We say, if this is God, then thus is God. So with this in view, Consider what happens in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When he was unjustly crucified, Jesus entered into the depths of suffering and death as a creature. Christians have always believed that this places Christ in solidarity with all people who suffer, who struggle, who are dying, who are victims of injustice, and that's true. His presence brings strength and comfort and hope amid the suffering. Now, the logic of deep incarnation gives a strong warrant for extending this solidarity from the cross into the groan of suffering and the silence of death of all creatures. Jesus' anguished death places him in the company of all who die. It is as if by inhabiting the inside of the isolating shell of death, Christ crucified brings divine life into closest contact with disaster, setting up a gleam of light for all other creatures who suffer that same annihilating suffocation of death. In their suffering and dying, they are not left alone. Gregerson proposes, and I quote, understood in this way, the death of Christ becomes an icon of God's redemptive co-suffering with all sentient life, as well as the victims of social injustice, end quote. Seen through the lens of deep incarnation, Calvary graphically shows that the God of suffering love abides with all creatures, bearing the cost of new life through endless millennia of evolution, from the extinction of whole species to, yes, every little bird that falls to the ground. Now, you may well be asking, what difference does this make? Animals still suffer and die. Yes, in the nature of things on earth, every living being dies eventually. But God's love does not quit just because creatures are in trouble. The spirit of Christ is with them despite what is happening. In fact, in the depths of what is happening. Is there in that God-forsaken moment as only the giver of life can be with the promise of something more. The Australian theologian Dennis Edwards put it this way. God's spirit is with each creature now, with every wild predator and prey with every dying whale, sparrow, and kangaroo as midwife to new birth when all will be made new. Now Christians make this bold claim, and it is a bold claim, in the light of Easter. He is risen, we say. The Easter narratives witness that the crucified Jesus died not into nothingness, but into the embrace of the God of life who enfolded him with affection. The living God, being faithful in love, rescued him from annihilation. So here, deep incarnation 
and deep cross flow into deep resurrection. Alleluia's ring out at Easter because Jesus' destiny signals what lies ahead for all human beings. Death overcome, new life. Only for us, though? In the fourth century, St. Ambrose of Milan started his Easter homily with these words. In Christ's resurrection, the earth itself arose. In Christ's resurrection, the earth itself arose. In other words, the risen Jesus pledges a future for all the dead, not only the human dead, but the dead of all species, because God will redeem the whole cosmos. The reasoning for this belief in deep resurrection runs along the same lines as deep incarnation. Jesus of Nazareth, the word made flesh, was a genuine part of the community of life on earth. His body existed in a network of relationships drawn from the whole physical universe. As a human being on this planet, he died, his life ripped away by an act of state violence. The earth claimed him back in a grave. Raised by the power of God from the dead, he has been reborn not as a spirit, but as a child of the earth, radiantly transfigured. To be clear, resurrection is not belief in the immortality of the soul. Jesus does not shuck off his humanity like a suit of clothes and rising heavenward goes into back into pure divinity. Rather, his entire human historical bodily self in all its dimensions is pervaded by the vivifying spirit of God and made whole in a new way. One with the flesh of the earth, he embodies the hope that the future final situation of the world will be the salvation of everything, all creation, which is now groaning, brought into the embrace of the holy God of love. There is a hymn in the New Testament that sings, Christ is the firstborn of the dead. It's in Colossians chapter one. And indeed the hymn says, Christ is the firstborn of all creation. And this good news, the text continues, should be proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Since God who creates and empowers the evolutionary world also joins the fray in Christ, personally drinking the cup of suffering and going down into death, then affliction, even at its worst, does not have the last word. The evolving world of life all creatures in their living and dying will not be left behind, but will be transfigured by the saving action of the creator God. Every creature will be blessed according to its own nature as part of the whole creation, which will be made new. Now Laudato Si dares to teach this hope. It's an amazing uh, paragraph at the very end of the encyclical, 243. And I quote here, at the end, we will find ourselves face to face with the infinite beauty of God, end quote. And then Francis goes on, we will not be only there by ourselves. We humans will not be alone. The whole universe will, quote, share with us in unending plenitude, quote, Eternal life will be a shared experience of awe in which each creature resplendently transfigured will take its rightful place, end quote. Each creature transplendently refigured, transfigured will take its rightful place. So the story of Jesus Christ, incarnation, life, death, and resurrection shows that there is not one beloved human species over here and another less beloved or unbeloved species over there. No, all together, we form one beloved community now and into the future, promised but unknown. So I get to my third and last point. 
conversion. What then should we do? In our day, faith in God who enfolds all creatures with affection calls us humans to conversion to an ecological vocation. We, our, us, our sense of human identity needs to expand beyond our individual isolation to include relationship with other creatures, the land, the sea, and the air, all creation itself. And once we have truly appreciated the life of the other, we arrive at a new starting point for decision-making. We can start changing some of the deep-seated behaviors that are driving environmental destruction, our galloping poverty, our cultural despair. Humbled and delighted by the other life around us, we can grow to hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor and step up to protect our kin. But be warned, after so many centuries of human-centered thinking, it is terribly hard to climb down from our self-assigned position of privilege and take our place as kin sharing a common home. And I confess, I find it difficult. I keep forgetting this. Having been trained the other way for so many years, it's hard, okay? We have lived so long with this picture of ourselves as subject inhabiting a world that ours is our object and resource, that it's difficult to imagine that it might not be true, that it might be otherwise, right? We have lived so long dazzled by our own intelligence and power that such a basic change can be wrenching. And this is why recent popes, including Pope Francis and theologians and spiritual writers all use the language of conversion here, conversion of mind and heart. That language underscores the magnitude of the challenge. We need to pivot, metanoia, turn, change direction. And in a way that might sound strange to religious ears, we need to be converted to the earth. Usually conversion means turn away from the earth toward God. This conversion calls us to be converted to the earth because we love God who loves the earth. Now in our polarized human society today, it is already tough to expand the boundary of what we mean by us beyond our own particular silo to include humans who differ by race, gender, class, sexual orientation, immigration status, political opinion, religion, and other markers by which we shape our personal identities. Thankfully, the core biblical teaching to love your neighbor as yourself exerts a constant pressure to go beyond the limits of our prejudice in order to love, respect, and do justice to all people so all human beings are included in us. But if this poses a challenge, how much harder it is to cross the species line and see other living creatures who are not homo sapiens included when we say us. However, like loving our human neighbor, faith challenges us to do so. If there is one God, one holy mystery of love who creates and sustains all creatures, who enfolds all with affection, whose word became flesh in Jesus Christ as part of the biosphere, this Jesus whose death on the cross puts him in solidarity with all living creatures that suffer and whose resurrection promises a blessed future for all of creation, then we, our, us, includes all our fellow creatures. Almost with agony, Laudato Si applies this view to the ongoing catastrophe of the extinction of species. Think about it. When a species goes extinct, it means there are no new babies, hence no future for that kind of living being. Snapped off the tree of life, the species will never come back. So while death means the end of an individual, 
Extinction means the death of birth itself for that species. And then, of course, damage to all the other creatures in the ecosystem with which that species interacted. This is happening to species today at an ever faster rate. In my view, we should be holding funerals. In view of this disaster, Pope Francis writes, and I quote, each year sees the disappearance of thousands of plant and animal species, which we will never know, which our children will never see, because they have been lost forever. The great majority become extinct for reasons related to human activity. Because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. We have no such right, end quote. And later in the encyclical, Pope Francis says, if we were truly converted to honoring community of creation, then, and this is a quote, we would feel the extinction of a species as a personal disfigurement. I confess I'm not there yet, but if we really felt bonded with other creatures, the fact that they die and disappear, not as individuals, but as, as a whole type, we would feel that as personal disfigurement. So we are being called to this vision, to this kind of belief, and to conversion. What's involved? Well, quietly contemplating the earth in prayer is one way to get there. So too is learning the amazing facts about the lives of other species in diverse ecosystems. Living simply in terms of material goods is another good practice. We might want to take as a Lenten practice fasting from shopping. Also banding together with others in public for political and legal actions to protect the natural world also moves us in the right direction. Not only each of us as individuals, but the church as a whole, as a community, and as an institution is called to this conversion because God enfolds the whole of creation with affection. With a different God, the people of God would be a different people. So to conclude, We've been reflecting on how at this time of ecological crisis, faith in God summons us to redefine ourselves as human beings in the community of creation because we love God. Caring about the world that God so loves, we urgently need to broaden our understanding of we, our, us, among other beloved creatures in whom the God who loves all is tremendously interesting, interested. Now, far from being a fantasy, such an ecological human identity is truer, both to the religious view of biblical faith and, as we saw, to scientific reality. So clearly, an enormous work lies ahead to bring this sensibility to birth in church liturgies, in preaching, hymns, all kinds of prayer, in theology, in religious education, in moral teaching, pastoral work, in internal church policies, and public advocacy. Responsible, self-sacrificing commitment to social justice and eco-justice flow as a result. So a final vision. A flourishing humanity on a thriving planet, rich in species, in an evolving universe, all together filled with the glory of God. Such is the vision that must guide us at this critical time of Earth's distress to practical and critical effect. Ignoring this view keeps people of faith and their churches locked into irrelevance while a terrible drama of life and death is being played out in the real world. By contrast, 
being converted to the earth in the power of the spirit, sets us off on a great adventure of mind and heart, expanding the repertoire of our love. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's um, really amazing. Uh, well done there. Um, I think that that was uh, very thought provoking and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A at the end. Uh, Eleanor, I see your hand is raised. Uh, we'll have a Q&A at the very end of the uh, program today, so I'll get to you then. Um, Sister Judy will give a word of thanks, and um, if I may say, Kodo, uh, Kodo Makaba, um, while she's giving her thanks, go ahead and turn on your computer and make sure that we can stream um, um, seamlessly, sorry, seamlessly move into your presentation thereafter. But uh, um, in case um, our visitors here don't know, Sister Judith Coyle, um, she's been a, a foundation to San Augustine College, South Africa, for a long time. Uh, PhD at Notre Dame, uh, no Notre Dame, sorry. Oh, and awesome. <laughs> and um, uh, her, um, she's the head of theology here, and her specialty is um, spirituality and Vatican II studies. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Sister Judy. Oh, thank you very much, Justin. It's difficult to know what to say, Elizabeth. <laughs> It is difficult to know uh, what kind of a response would do justice to what you have um, uh, shared with us, the ideas that you have implanted in us, the uh, desires that you stir up, the possible vision and um, realities that you put before us in our faith, in our world, in our created order. Um, occasionally, when you were speaking, I, I had echo heard something of Chardin in what you were, what you were talking about. That's that's pretty good company to be in. <laughs> I think so, but um, you 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 resituate the entire entire thing, and as you say, it will take a long time for us to to arrive there. But if we don't start, and if we don't have the vision, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where we're going, and you give us a vision and sometimes in the church it does seem like we don't know where we're going <laughs> and in society just as well but you have uh, put before us a great um, a challenge we are on the verge of lent uh, the period in which perhaps we can reflect more even more on many of the things that you've said um, hold those in our prayer in our action in our prayer and fasting and, and in our almsgiving um, to, to bring about within us a conversion to this creation so marvelously um, um, uh, uh, examined for us. Uh, examine is the wrong word, but um, um, envision for us in, in this presentation. Um, you, you show us also really what is the work of the theologian? What is the work of the theologian? Your theologizing, your words about God, <laughs> um, uh, bring us to a deeper faith, I think, in, in uh, listening to you, in um, holding some of what you have tried to um, uh, present to us. We are very grateful. We are extremely grateful. We hope you... Um, continue to carry on this great Theologos um, uh, for, for a long time, um, bringing us in some ways to our senses, to our sensate selves, <laughs> and to the depths of the possibilities of our faith and of our belief and of our action. So we, we thank you very much for coming again to South Africa. As Terry said, you were here once before many years ago with Larry Kaufman, who is here also tonight. Um, and uh, so we will um, uh, just offer you the thanks of our heart, of our minds, of our of our thoughts and our actions. Thank you, Judy. Giabonga gakulu, as the Zulu people would say, giabonga gakulu. Thank you for that really heartfelt uh, message. Um, uh, I just want to go ahead and uh, since we have, I want to save some time for some q and I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker coming up. Um, she is uh, Koda Makaba. She was a um, 
master's student here, and she recently um, completed her infill. And her mini dissertation was on um, the Trinity, particularly looking at uh, perichoresis and how it could be a framework for um, social models, particularly in marriage, but also within communities. Uh, Sister Elizabeth Johnson's work was um, widely influential in this. And if you've read any of her work, you'll, um, especially she who is, uh, you will immediately recognize the word perichoresis and how valuable it is. Uh, Kota Makaba is an amazing figure, and she was an absolute joy to be um, a collaborator with. I wouldn't even call her my student, I'd call her a collaborator. Uh, she is an Anglican priest. Um, she holds a lot of hats as well, uh, or wears a lot of hats. She's an Anglican priest. Um, she's also a life coach. Um, she's a published author. She published a book on of relationships, um, a handbook to help people who are uh, having troubles within their relationships. She also published a book on uh, poetry called The Woman in Me, Walking in Confidence. Uh, it's an anthology of poems and also stories and other things to inspire and open people up. Uh, she's also an entrepreneur. Um, she recently launched her own pro um, hair care product uh, um, to um, in take off the, the ties or finish off the ties of twists and hair. So again, um, a woman for all seasons. I'm really happy that um, she is presenting. Uh, Kodo, I'll hand the floor over to you now. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, I really am honored to be part of this gathering this evening, especially to hear my, I think she is just, uh, to, for me, when I went through her works and uh, I just said, I prayed that one day I would meet her. And uh, that prayer was actually answered today when I met her. Uh, shall we go to the next uh, slide? Today, uh, your, your, your presentation, uh, Sister Elizabeth, really left me uh, wondering because there are three questions that you raised. The first question was, why is it hard to see that everything is connected to everything else? And the second question, why, why is it hard to feel this existentially? And the third question you asked was, why is being part of a splendid community and folded by divine affection, not the position of the praying church, which was scary. And I've got my own question, which is in the next slide. And my the next slide, please, Justin. And my question is, why is it hard for us, especially Christians, to engage in conversion about our understanding of how God, through the Trinity, can be born to our responses to the challenges of our daily experience. And why is it hard for us to engage in conversion about how our articulation and enhance our comprehension of relationality and agency as we journey through life as Christians? So I have those two questions, but I'm going to address them today. And as I was going through my resource, you know, just doing my, my research, I came across Rhonda Sarazin. And Rhonda Sarazin in the Trinitarian Theology of Elizabeth Johnson, a practical application says, humanity's experience of God is of a gracious mystery that is ever greater, ever nearer, and requires a shift from a cosmic understanding of God to a God who is concerned with the subject, the humanity. It requires a shift, conversion, from a cosmic understanding of God by humanity. And then she goes on to quote you again, she from she who is, but then she expresses this. She says, Johnson states that the Trinity is the most immanent way in which humanity experiences God, and it's the most mm -hmm. neglected doctrine within the, the church. And I suppose that's why my theme for this evening is from doctrine to practice. And I know that I'm skating on thin ice. 
because I'm still new here. <laughs> uh, but I want to just go into the treasure. We just go to the next uh -huh. slide. Now, Myra's love talks about the Trinity, the versatility of this Trinity, and says that it could provide convergence for us, and that it's a possible social analogy because of its pericorrect nature, which is found in the Trinity. Now, and he says commitment and unconditional love, acceptance and forgiveness, which we find very difficult to do, mutuality and interdependence, knowing mm -hmm. and being known, knowing, really knowing, and unity without absorption. Because we have the understanding that if I go into unity, I have to be absorbed into that unity. Uh, we, we do not understand that I can be in unity without being ab absorbed into that unity. Shall we go on to the next slide? And, and, and that is based on our relatedness. That goes in hand in hand with our particularity. And I like it when we talk about the Trinity, we say there's differentiation in unity, that perichoresis is actually reciprocal interiority. And Miroslav Wolf puts it in this way. He says, in every divine person, in the Trinity as a subject, the other persons also indwell. All mutuality permeating one another, though in doing so, they do not cease to be distinct persons. There is that being dif di difference. Uh, and what is this perichoresis that we are talking about? And I'd like to go into that now. But before I do, I want us to keep in mind our context. Looking around, you know, in the so on the social panorama, there's degeneration of families, church families, congregations, relationships, marriages, and general interhuman relations. Hence, there's so much that is going, that is painful and very sad amongst us as humanity. However, if we go on, shall we? Johnson today says, which, which gave me hope, in our beautiful, terrible, fragile, and vulnerable lives, we all share the fundamental identity of belonging to the same generous God and a king in the community. There's share, fundamental identity, belonging, same generous God, king, community, perichoretic nature. Let us go to the next one. Now, the perichoretic nature of the, un of the Trinity, what do you find in this perichoresis? So that we understand it just as people and not as some kind of a doctrine or dogma. There is the associates in the Trinity are connected. There is the perichoretic character of being one is central. There's interaction. And the perichoretic nature mirrors a communion, intimacy, and personal relationality. And that personal relationality is not subject to conditional unity. We have conditional love for one another. I will like you because you agree with me I will dislike you because you do not agree with me. And, and, and what uh, the Trinity, if we were to emulate the Trinity, we would be connected in such a manner as is found in the Trinity. But I like the way Christopher West puts it. He says, a common union of persons in the Trinity is established to the degree that the persons mutually give themselves 
to one another in sacrificial love. And he goes on to say, and wow, the father eternally begets the son by giving himself to and for the son. And in turn, the son eternally receives the love of the father and eternally gives himself back to the father. And then he closes this up, up by saying, this ever shared, ever spiraling love between these two is driven by the Holy Spirit, who, as we say in the Nicene Creed, proceeds from the Father and the Son. So he's part of the Father and the Son. And then he closes it and says, perfect love, perfectly and eternally given, perfectly and eternally received, perfectly and eternally returned. And then in two words, summarizes it. That's God. Wow, that is powerful. For me, that's the most powerful assertion I have ever read about the perichoretic nature of the Trinity. That makes it easier for us to understand. Shall we go to the next slide? Now, Dominic Muse, who happens to be one of the African Christologers, his main argument is that in the Trinity, the same divine life, life, and, and I think our sister this evening talked about life a lot, is shared equally and totally among the divine persona who are, as a consequence, one and identical in life nature and power. Very powerful assertion. Shall we go to the next slide? And then consequently, what he says is that we as Christians need to begin of thinking of what he calls homegrown theology, a theology that is contextually relevant. We should not see the Trinity as a doctrine but as an analogy to learn from, to transform our context. And if we do did that, so much will change among humans. And I thought of the greatest commandment that our sister also quoted, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I said to myself, but you know what? I can never be able to give to the other person something that I do not love, I do not have. So if I do not see myself as an important part of humanity, then I can't see the other person as an important part of humanity. I can't give what I don't have. Shall we go to the next one? However, my focus this evening is on relationality because I think that's where our relationships lie. Relationality and agency within the relationality. Shall we go on to the next one? What is this relationality? It's connectedness where no one exists in isolation. Some people call it ujama. Some Harambe, some call it <laughs> Ibuanyidanda in Africa, where everyone exists as being in a special relationship, a relationship in a special context, where we have between the two of us a created order where there's equality and unity within self efficiency. We'll talk about that in agency, yet dependency. So it's that connectedness where we celebrate individuality as individuality is celebrated in the Trinity, in the diversity, within a dynamic, mutually intimate relationship wherein all actors are recognized, honored, and respected. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. Without the Father, the Trinity is not complete. Without the Son, the Trinity is incomplete. Without the Holy Spirit, the Trinity is incomplete. Shall we go to them? Now, 
Dominic Muser illustrates it in a different way. He looks at John chapter 16, verse 15, when Jesus is teaching about relationality in the Trinity. He tells his disciples this. He says, all what the Father has is mine as Jesus, and that the Father would take what is Jesus's and give it to them as the disciples, as an expression of brotherhood, communion, kinship, ujama, ibuanyidanda, ubuntu, social harmony, etc. Shall we go to the next one? Now, Rian Fenta, he talks, of the, he talks about the grammar now, grammar of hospitality. He says, in Trinitarian theology, we need to be aware of the grammar of hospitality where we remember that all humans bear the image of God, all humans are relational, all humans depend upon each other, all humans are hosted by God. Shall we continue to the next one? And Elochuku Zuku, talking about the same thing, he says, God has a communal dimension, a communal dimension that reflects communion, sharing, dialogue, respect for all cultures in the postmodern world that is determined by globalization. He cites attributes that are inherent in hospitality and relationality as participation, common responsibility, respect for diverse individuality, spiritual connectedness, spiritual unity, and communal interconnection. There are other theologians as well. Shall we continue? Enoch one and Mark Herding, they confirm what the other theologians have said. They say the three in the Trinity share their attributes of deity and they see themselves, it begin, love your neighbor as you love yourself. They see themselves as equally deserving of recognition honor and worship and date. And I said to myself, how, you know, it, it would, let's just imagine how humans would relate to one another if we acknowledge that we are equally deserving of honor and all, you know, together. Shall we continue? Innocent Asozo expresses this very differently. He talks about unity in diversity in praxis. And he says, the ideal unity in diversity, and, and I like this, she, he says, can therefore be practiced in the most authentic way where this guarantees that the natural rights of individuals as members of the same human family that seek common good as the foundation of its legitimacy are taken into consideration. Shall we go to the next slide? Inokwan and Makadinga, understanding relationality, they say, we can learn from the Trinity, relationality. They cite the unity in the hypostatic uh, union of the three as a principle that could be functional in human life and that individually actually finds strength in diversity. However, let's go to the next one. Such relationality needs a stronger and effective sense of agency amongst us as humans, as found in the Trinity. Now let's talk about that agency. What is this agency? Let's go to the next. Mary Lamla says agency is one's ability to take action, be effective, influence one's own life assume responsibility to so one's behavior such that one believes in themselves to such an extent that they experience stability in their lives so that their actions can relate to the lives of their characters, they impact. And, and, and she talks about what Emma Bayer and Mish call relational arithmetics. You know, let's go to the next one. So the MMPI and measure go further than that. They focus on how one's action impacts not just 
their environment, but relational pragmatics, the dynamics of interaction in their environment. Shall we continue? Now on agency, why agency? It enables potency of the actor's capability. If I have agency, then I become potent. When I have agency, I take responsibility to create a space that is mutually beneficial, not only for me only, because in mind, I have got relationality. And I become an actor that has the power to shape the circumstances and the conditions around me in a processual way, manner. And you know, when I got to that part, I thought of the salvific process. I commit to the common good as found within the Trinity. And I view myself as a co-creator with all people around me, wherein the other people assume identifiable roles. If you do your role, I do mine, and together for the common good, as you find in the Trinity. Let's go to the next one. Now, in Trinitarian agency, let's look at Trinitarian agency now. That was general agency. Keith Johnson says, Trinitarian agency is the way in which the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together in creation, providence, and redemption. And, 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 and I had this question, what is this way that we are talking about? And St. Augustine says, According to the scriptures, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the inseparable equality present divine unity and therefore they are not three gods, but one God. There's unity of agency. And he goes on to say that that the Son was sent is by no means a revelation of the inferiority of the Son, but that the one is the begetter the other begotten, and their temporal missions correspond. So, so when I look at this, I see that St. Augustine adds mission to agency. There's relationality, there's agency, there's mission that is connected to this agency. Shall we go to the next one? But that mission is sacred. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I adorned you. God pronounces divine agency. And, and it cannot be diluted by competing with anybody else. And if we are to keep in mind this in mind, we would believe in our own ability, which is our agency. We would take action and be active. We would influ influence our environment meant as it divinely as intended, we would confidently assume responsibility for our behavior and not blame other people for our actions and be agents of stability in the common arena. And, and I, I looked at this and I said, you know, this we can do if we focus on similarities rather than differences. That if there is no debate, no competition about the common understanding of the value of the agency, we need to have collective shared and mutual perception and assimilation, interpretation, and mastery of our roles. We need to have cohesive consciousness. Asosu calls it that, innocent. But he says it comes from authentic knowledge, authentic knowledge. And I looked at this and I said to myself, we need to learn from this. Shall we go to the next one? But there's caution <laughs> to all this. Keith Johnson cautions us. He says, we shouldn't just go into this with all the excitement and emotion, the imitate the Trinity approach. We have to imitate the character of the divine persons and emulate their attributes, spirituality, knowledge, 
as Christians and not be Christians who go to church on Sunday and during the week, we are just like everybody else. Wisdom, trustworthiness, goodness, love and mercy, holiness, righteousness and justice among others. It's not, it's a tall order. It's not a walk in the park. But our learning could be that we need to reflect social harmony in our pursuit and emulation of relationality and agency within Trinity. And we need to reflect these pericorrective characteristics in our families, because that is all, where it all begins. You know, the family of God as Christians, our collegial relationships, political and marriages. And, 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 and if we could do this, those rivaling barriers could be broken and we could together, wherever we are, begin to create a homegrown theology of hospitality. Shall we go to the next one? So I, remember, I recommend that we learn from the perichoric nature of the Trinity, especially relationality and agency, instead of viewing the doctrine of the Trinity as a static church dogma. And I think that in our concerted effort, we would reflect the concept of perichoresis, hospitality, unity in diversity, self-giving, unity of consciousness, interpenetration, mutual indwelling, perichoretic unity, togetherness, social harmony, communality, harambe, ujama, ubuntu, ibuanyidanda, common brotherhood, belongingness, kinship, mutual permeation. And according to our sister Elizabeth this evening, the we, our, and us could be commonly shared for the common good in both the Trinity and in our lives. In this way, we would endeavor to harmonize and unify realities in spite of their perceived variability. That's what Okbonaya and Azubuike say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that was uh, extremely well done. Thank you so much, Kodo. Um, well, at this point in time, I will um, uh, go ahead and start taking questions. But while I'm doing that, um, um, Sister Elizabeth Johnson, if you would like to respond to uh, Koto or anything that uh, Sister Judy uh, Coyle said, um, the floor is yours. Uh, I would say, though, that if you have a question, then please use the raise your hand button, and then I'll have a uh, running tally of who raised their hand first. So while she's responding, go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll start ordering the questions and play traffic on, basically. So please, uh, Sister Willard Johnson, you have the floor for now. Good. Uh, I just want to thank Koto for that beautiful presentation. And I kept thinking, as you were talking about the perichoretic nature of the Trinity, how much it it carries forward the ideas that I was saying in my talk, because yes. I was speaking about, you know, God, the creator and Jesus Christ and the indwelling spirit, but not going into Trinity per se. Part of that was the limitation of time, but it just perfectly dovetails and because what you're saying flows into the whole human community, but then beyond the human community to the whole community of life as interconnected mm -hmm. with, with the um, Trinity, having created the world, is reflecting that perichoretic nature in the interaction of all creatures with each other. So I just thought it was a, a splendid, uh, besides how valuable in itself, to connect up with what I said. I think it just, the next step is what you took there. You know? um, I would just say one other thing about what Judy Coyle said. Um, the, what it means to be a theologian is to say, you know, theos means God and logos, so say a word about God. And it's just such a, um, a wonderful thing to be able to do that. And we all, anyone who's a believer does that in their own way, but to be called to that professionally, to try to do that with some background as to church teaching and the history of it and so on, is a wonderful, um, a wonderful calling. And everyone, I think, who's on this uh, this uh, presentation and this session uh, is sharing in that. And what I what I am loving here is the interaction of us be 
uh, across the oceans, across you know intercontinental conversation we're having here on this um, on this very splendid and not always easy um, calling to try to articulate what we mean when we say God, and therefore and then the effect that has on every everything, every one and every other creature. So it was a it's a, a great insight. You forget that you're doing that sometimes. But that's the fundamental calling. Yeah. Well, that, that's really nice. Uh, Coda, did you uh, you look like you wanted to respond real quickly? No, thank you. Not for now. Okay. Thank you very much. But I can only say thank you to Sister uh, Elizabeth for those kind words. Thank you. Well, no one's raised their hand for a question yet, so I'm going to be selfish and ask a question myself. Uh, okay. Um, I really love this idea of deep incarnation and where you're taking it. Um, so this is a yes and question. I'm yes anding you. I'm, um, I'm curious about the knock on effect of that um, in the integrated nature of systematic theology. So what would you consider like a deep soteriology or a deep eschatology? Because right. uh, as you were talking before as well, like uh, the traditional medieval or classical, if you will, or scholastic uh, theology is that humans go to heaven and the, the world uh, dissipates. So a deep incarnation has um, a knock-on effect to a deep soteriology. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that um, and could expand. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so clear from the, um, the resurrection section that I talked about. I mean, it's salvific. And it really surprised me, but also delighted me the way Laudato Si ends, because it ends in that paragraph that I wrote, that in heaven, we will not be alone, but all creatures transfigured will share with us in endless bliss. So there's this famous line, as you probably well know, <laughs> that you get asked when you do this kind of thing, will I see my dog in heaven? You mm -hmm. know, people. And according to church teaching in the past, the answer was no, because they don't have a soul. And so they can't participate. So on. But now, you know, the shift that's happening, it's really radical when you say the answer is yes, <laughs> you know, that God created that dog and loved that dog and has a future in mind for that dog that is not simply annihilation. Um, it's the nature of love to be faithful all the way through. And I think that um, the more we work on this, the more the soteriology gets deeper and deeper. And, you know, it is the sense of biblical sense that the whole world is going to be saved, the creation saved. You look at the book of Revelation, um, you know, in chapter five there, um, I heard every creature singing praise to the one on the throne, you know, it's, it's, it's a, once you start with the idea of God as the creator of all out of love, then the rest has to follow uh, if God is faithful. So deep soteriology has, it, it, as I said, there's a huge amount of work to be done to flesh this out. But yes, it's, it's clearly an implication. There's no question about it. Mm. I remember uh, I was reading your paper and I let my wife, um, who's also a philosopher, she uh, does Marcuse. And uh, she's Calvinist or uh, uh, Reformed. And uh, I let her read that. And she's like, so Marmite gets to go to heaven? Uh, because Marmite's our cat. And she was just like, oh, sign me up. Mary <laughs> 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 uh, McCreeth, uh, you have a question. Uh, just make sure you unmute yourself so we can hear you. And then y'all can uh, me after that. Mary, you have yes. a uh, Can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can. Yes. Um, I. I have been quite thrilled with this because I lately watched a video by Nora Bateson on the uh, ecology of the mind. And she's, uh, you, you're speaking from a theological context. And she's, she and her father were talking about the very same thing but from an anthropological concept. Uh, and I'm just seeing it, it's a whole matter of pers not just of thinking from the mind, but perceiving reality, perceiving a whole different type of reality around us, not, uh, not just theolo th theologizing over something, but beginning to see the spoon and the knife and the fork and the, and the meal and, and the meal that you eat every day as as the body of 
of I'm I'm thinking of the universal mm -hmm. Christ of Ter de Chardin, uh, which had been part of what I've been interesting in. So I'm just seeing a whole connection uh, yeah. wider than th theology, wider than Christianity. That it's a worldwide thing now to, to be coming to a greater perception of who this planet belongs to. It's, it's a so, comment. Amen. Oh, right. Amen. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Yaku, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, and uh, um, uh, Reverend Debojo, uh, you can come up after him, okay? Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, for that uh, beautiful and wonderful presentation, thought-provoking. Uh, also, thanks to Koto, much appreciated. My, my question, actually, I have two questions, if I might be uh, allowed, Justin. The first one is, is, is a little is, perhaps more innocuous somehow. And then the second one is a bit more um, tongue in cheek, maybe. Right. So the first one has to do with the, the notion of dignity in Laudato Si, right? So um, the Second Vatican Council, I think it was Pope John the 23rd that says um, the, the whole of uh, you know, Catholic social teaching hinges on this one notion, the dignity of the human person, right? The inherent dignity of the human person. And that's been a central theme in Catholic social teaching. Now, um, along comes Laudato Si, and with its, uh, well, as you've wonderfully presented, with its broadening of everything, you know. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting, uh, and I might be wrong, but I've looked at, you know, done a couple of word searches in Laudato Si, and you get the word value in there. You have the intrinsic value of all creatures, and you have also the intrinsic worth of all creatures. So Pope Francis talks about the intrinsic value, but he refrains from talking about the dignity of all creatures. He reserves the word dignity, I think. He remains to reserve the word dignity for the human. So I'm wondering what just sort of what would you think? Do you think we could be warranted to extend um, intrinsic dignity also? Can the church in its social teaching perhaps make that bold <coughs> statement of saying also every, every creature has dignity, not only value, but dignity, a certain kind of value? That's my first question, right? And you might want to, I don't know if you want to respond to that first before I ask a second one. Yeah, let me just say, that is fascinating. I have not done those word searches. So thank you for sharing that. That is really, I think it's very astute because frankly, my reading of Laudato Si is that it's still pretty anthropocentric. In other words, it, mm -hmm. it sketches out what I chose to emphasize. But what you're pointing to is there's still that core of the human you know, be in the center of it all mm -hmm. rather than being. In, so I was pushing La Dato C in what I was saying further. So I think you're absolutely right. So the question is, do we dare to say, well, you know, you look at some animals, um, the dignity is there. If you, if you understand what dignity means, mm -hmm. uh, the way they behave, the way they carry themselves, the way they act, the way they treat their ch children, the way they treat their dead. Um, it goes on kind of thing. Uh, I think we could, you know, be bold to do that. I think, uh, and, and still at the same time say, there's something about human beings that also is unique. And, and see, that's the part I would not want to lose. In fact, in, in um, giving lectures on this elsewhere, I, I've been tempted to say and have said, if you don't think the human race is unique, just ask yourself, who is wrecking the planet? Okay, we are the only species that have that power and, we, and we're wrecking it for everyone else, including ourselves. Uh, we are different. It isn't, um, when, when it's, this is not a leveling argument, making everybody the same. But as uh, Koto was saying, in and through our difference, the unity that we all have as creatures of God in the one community of creation. So to use dignity, I think you're warranted to go there. I mean, La da, you, you, you'd be pushing Laudato Si, but I think that, I always say that's not an end, that's a beginning of conversation and it's cyclical like that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. I definitely, I, I, I share that sentiment uh, of yours. Uh, thank you for that. So the second 
question has to do with the notion of deep resurrection, which I also have much appreciation for, also as you elaborated it now in uh, answering uh, um, Justin's question. Just a bit uh, sort of pushing there then. What, I, you know, what would prevent some Christians, if we accept this notion of deep resurrection, that in the end, living creatures, all creatures will will participate in the glory of God, right? Um, and that's what what would why why would we then care if things die? Because in the, in the end, everything will participate in the glory of God, almost like the apocatastasis, you know, everyone might still, you know, in the end, share in God's glory. Why? Why is it then bad that things die? Why, why is extinction when you bad? Say, uh, Jaco, when you say die, are you talking about go extinct? The point I made about a species going extinct? Well, perhaps both. I mean, so for, for a certain epoch in history, there, there's less species diversity. So is the underlying point actually the, the diversity um, that's beautiful? Is, 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 right. is it the beauty um, that is there in that deep re resurrection of the diversity and the plurality? That's So I'm asking a bit, I'm just prodding the tongue in Right. Well, the fact is, let me let me say two things just very simply, because we could go on with this, I think, for a long time. It's so interesting what you're bringing up. Everything dies. That is of the nature of biological life. That is, you might want to push back further and say, why did God create such a world in which everything dies? But that's a different question. The, f the fact is, everything, there is not one single thing on this planet that's alive that doesn't die. So it's built in. Either you live a couple hours like the mayflower, mayflies, or, you know, hundreds of years like the giant sequoia trees in California, whatever. Uh, but nothing lives forever. And so death is part of the routine. And it's, as scientists say, if it weren't for death, uh, if evolution would not have happened. You have to have the one generation pass and the next generation take it a little different to the next uh you know, change, or or it would be in the end, there'd be no development of life whatsoever. So the fact that creatures die is not uh, necessarily opposed. In fact, it, it's, it's in the service of life. The question is, in what manner they die? And, and this comes to my second point. Today, the extinction of species is more akin to murder than natural death. Because species are not being allowed because of what this species ourselves are doing to live out the full range of their natural life and produce another kind of species on their branch of the tree of life. So we are destroying what has taken tens of millions of years to build up on this planet by way of the interrelation of beautiful life. And that's why that's, you know, um, it, it's just a wrecking of creation. And if you're a lover of God, this is this is horrible. It isn't just normal death. So it's the difference between murder and living out your full and living dying old and full of years and being taken to your ancestors, as the Bible says about it. Abraham, that's the kind of life that we would consider ideal and normal, like uh, to be desired. You know? Thank you very much. If you don't mind me jumping in, uh, my uh, uh, my mentor, whenever I was in my master's program at Villanova, Darlene Weaver, a uh, moral theologian, excellent woman, um, she, her recent work on social sin uh, criticizes the way um, salvation was used as a cop out of sorts in a lot of uh, um, Christian um, teaching. Oh, well, they're suffering now, but guess what? They'll have eternal glory in heaven, so we'll let them suffer for now. It's okay. And um, so that became sort of a cop out for a lot of theology and a lot of the uh, right. justifications for horrible acts, especially colonialism. And uh, she brings in the idea of social sin and how we need to look at social sin and preservation and so forth. But it goes back to what Coda was saying a little bit. But uh, yeah, there, there is a history there. That's all I'm trying to say is that there's a history there of using resurrection as a cop out for not doing anything here on earth. Uh, and we oh, have to yeah. be careful with that. Yeah. But see, again, I think if you start with um, creation and really uh, plumb the depths of what we mean by God creating this world out of love, when you love mm -hmm. something, you want it to flourish. 
Mm -hmm. You know, you think of parents with children or lovers or anyone who loves someone and you don't want mm -hmm. to see it suffer. You don't want to see it wrecked, you know, and you have to go that way. Um, but, but you're right. The, the whole um, suffer now and, you know, you'll be rewarded later. Or the, the problem with that that we see today also is it cuts the nerve for social justice action because you say, well, put up with it. Be past, you know, you'll be rewarded instead of stand up and say, no, this should not be. Um, mm -hmm. th there's a whole shift in soteriology as a result of liberation theology uh, in that direction. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, Reverend uh, Tabaho, <coughs> sorry, um, water went down the wrong pipe. Um, you've got the floor, but then after that, uh, Bidi Tiernan, uh, thank you for your patience. You will come next. And then Natando Hedebe, uh, Dr. Natando Hedebe, who also worked and uh, consulted with Kota Makaba's. Uh, dissertation, by the way, um, you can speak afterwards. So uh, Tabojo, uh, Bidi, and then Natanda. Uh, please go ahead, Tabojo, you have to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Sister Johnson for this beautiful, powerful, liberating theology that uh, she has presented to us this evening. I am Tabojo, uh, a reverend in the AME Church and a graduate of St. Augustine College. From your presentation, from, from both uh, presentations, uh, what I've picked up or what has come to my attention is that African traditional religion has always respected and, 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 and you know, respected nature for, for, for what it is. In fact, in our tribal names, not tribe is not the right word, actually, in our clan names, you know, we, we, we do show respect to the nature uh, that, that we live amongst. But it is sad because of colonization. We have lost all of that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very sad that we have lost all of that. And the church has played a role in the erosion of that uh, worldview. Yeah. Now, my, my question is, how do we bring that back into the church? How do we do that? We've got the theology, but there, there, there is something, there is something we are not getting right in our ecclesiology. I just can't put a finger to it because we, we with our modern primitive minds, I think we still have a lot to learn from Trinitarian the uh, theology. We still have a lot to learn from, from Ubuntu, but we, we know enough. Now, coming back to, to Christ, I think with both uh, presentations, what sums up uh, 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 these presentations for me is the summary of, of the Decalogue. Hear what Christ our Savior says, Thou shalt love the Lord with the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second unto it is that we shall love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Upon these commandments hang all the laws and prophets. But why haven't we got it right? Thank you, mm. Thank you so much. That is a wonderful observation. Um, we in the West, as you mentioned, colonialism came with this hierarchy of being in the DNA of the church and its doctrine, and that was imposed. And as you said, so much has been lost and eroded as a result. But I have hope that um, I know in the United States, we work uh, on this question with Native Americans uh, who themselves 
almost suffered genocide when the Europeans came and, but had such a reverence for nature, such a connection with themselves, with the, the life that's around them to what we need to do. And I just simply say is humbly be quiet and learn from uh, indigenous peoples from, as you mentioned, African traditional religion. Uh, and that's happening in some quarters. Also, wherever Africans uh, are doing, for example, Christology, it's possible to bring in African traditional religion, consciousness and concepts and terms and weave them into the way Christ is presented. That's enculturation. And that also is happening to some degree. Um, when you started to speak, I was thinking you are lucky to have the treasure of coming forward with African traditional religion in your bones, you know, as, as an African. I don't have that. But the thing that we are doing, hopefully, and not enough of it exact, is listening and learning and understanding what the, what the church brought from Europe um, is, is we're saying, even in the church today, we're saying that is uh, in itself uh, radically inadequate and even wrong and harmful in terms of our relationship to the earth. So, I mean, I don't have an answer to your question, how do we, but but I'd say in your role, all right, what you, what you would bring in then is this consciousness and try to raise the consciousness of, uh, of others and connect make it be a way of speaking about Christ or a way of speaking about God, the creator, bringing in the African consciousness. That's a tremendous contribution that we all, we all need it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sister Elizabeth. Can I come in and, and just say that probably if we begin to see the Trinity as a, 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 a practicality in our lives, mm -hmm. then perhaps we could begin a process of, 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 of convergence. That's what I call it in my, in my mini dissertation. Mm -hmm. a, 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 a convergence, a space of convergence and take the Trinity as the foundation and look at the attributes that are ingrained in the Trinity. Because if you look at the attributes that are ingrained in the Trinity, you find them in all this Ujama, Ubuntu, Ibuani Danda, and Harambi, all of those. You find all those there. However, uh, there was what Asozu called, Innocent Asozu. He says there was a phenomenon of concealment and the phenomenon of concealment makes me to see you as I see you, not as I need to know you. Mm -hmm. If we, as the church and the traditionalist, could come together and think of a way forward and have a convergence space where all of us are equal as you find in the Trinity, where all of us are of equal importance as in the Trinity, where the agency, our agencies are all important, where's the, where there's relationality, I think that would be a very good spot to begin from. Uh, Biddy, thank you so much for um, all of this. This is amazing. Uh, Biddy, uh, please, uh, you're already unmuted, so go right ahead, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, and but, uh, for some reason, uh, your microphone's not working. It shows you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Are you muted? Yes. Can you hear me now? No? Uh, I can't hear you. Did you want to type your question? Okay, I will. Yeah, I'll just type it in the chat box. Um, okay. While he's typing that, Natanda, do you want to go ahead with yours? Where's the chat book? Natanda? She's muted. Yeah. Uh, Natanda, unmute yourself if you can. Sometimes whenever you're posting these things, you feel like you're in a seance. <laughs> can you hear me? Is Natanda here? <laughs> hmm. Um. 
Okay, so um, anybody have any other questions while we're working on this? Uh, Biddy, I can't see your question in the chat box, but uh, um, if you want to send it after the fact, or if you can get your microphone unmuted, then we can work it out. Um, or Natando, I'd hate to leave people's questions hanging. Uh, control your mic. Try it again. Yes, yeah, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, Biddy. I'm sorry, Biddy. Turn on push to talk. Why you push to talk? Oh, Natando, your, your camera's on now. That's good. Um, just uh, click the unmute button. Is that can you hear me? Or uh, you okay, so Terry says she can hear Biddy. So Terry, if you want to repeat Biddy's question for us, you you can. Okay. My question. Thank you, Susan Augustus and Elizabeth. My question has actually come from Elizabeth, Eleanor Larry, who had to leave. In the light of this call to conversion, is it sacrilegious or sacred to imagine all creation as the second person of the Blessed Trinity? Okay. Um, so, Terry, you said you can hear him. So, if you can just repeat what he said, um, that'd be nice. I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll try. And, and is it, Biddy, is it, the question is it sacrilegious or is it sacred? to imagine what was the next next part of it no put your mic off love to imagine all creation all right as the second person of the blessed trinity okay to imagine all creation as the second person in the trinity is it is it sacrilegious or is it sacred to imagine that um, all creatures are the second person in the Trinity. Second person. Uh, the second person being Jesus? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I could reformulate just a little bit, and Betty, you give me a thumbs up. Is it sacred or sacrilegious to consider um, um, Jesus as fully man and divine, that being a representative not just of humanity, but of all of creation? If that's what she said. Okay, that's the question. Did you follow yeah. there? Yeah, I think so. I think if, if I'm getting the question right, that I would say the answer is it's certainly sacred to think that way. Because we're talking about, um, if you go the route of deep incarnation, then when Christ becomes uh, a human being, and is one with the, with the humanity of the earth, the humanity of the earth is not an isolated nature and we are interacting and interconnected with all other creatures so by implication everything is connected um, in the word of god made flesh does that i don't know if that gets at what biddy was think, asking but that would be the direction i would be thinking i think going back to your paper you can say whenever you were talking about the iron in your blood is the same iron that shattered from the stars right well that same blood and that same iron is in jesus that's right Jesus and, that blood. Same, and, that same same blood. and the same blood is in the lion. Yeah. And in the kangaroo. That I mean, there's we're connected physically, even. Yeah. Right. And the same sun that shone on him is the same sun that keeps he's, the world. He's alive. giving thumbs up, so I think we did okay on this one. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Uh, Natando, do you want to bring us home? Uh just unmute yourself. It's the uh, bottom left button, the farthest oh. left button. Nontan non said she can't unmute. She's having difficulty unmuting. Uh, do you know what, she, what her question is, Terry? Oh, I don't know what her question is. She just wrote in the Oh, text. here it is. Here. Uh, my question is that in She Who Is, Elizabeth focused on the equality within the Trinity by starting with the Holy Spirit and since the Spirit is identified with female. I think she's typing a little bit more, so. All right, let me, let me repeat it all in one line here. My question is that in She Who Is, Elizabeth Johnson focused on the equality within the Trinity, starting with the Holy Spirit since the spirit is identified with female. There is a relationship between the marginalization of the spirit and women. So in the Trinity, the equality needs to... Um...
needs to be more explicit. The father is defined as the source and no res no rep no rep no reciprocity of the spirit. So I think her question basically boils down, and you can give me a thumbs up, Natanda, if I got this right. In She Who Is, um, you discuss the Holy Spirit um, and identify it with uh, um, the feminine. And um, there is a relationship between the marginalization of the spirit within our, um, our, our daily practice and belief and so forth, and also the marginalization of women. And so the, um, the equality between men, women, whatever you want to say, and equality between the Holy Spirit and the uh, and God and Jesus needs to become more explicit. Uh, perhaps the understanding of God as being defined as the source and so forth. Did I get you right there, Natanda? Yes, okay. So essentially the question is about the marginalization of women and the marginalization of the Holy Spirit and how that relates to um, your, um, uh, your, your present focus. Is that clear enough? Let me just say, first of all, hello, Notando. It's very good to see you again. <laughs> I, um, yes, and I think uh, I would just point to what Goto Mahaba was saying about perichoresis, because that dancing around together of the Trinitarian relationships uh, is equal. And so if you start, you know, from father to son and then the Holy Spirit gets dismissed or gets forgotten and, you know, women are subordinated along the way, a, a more traditional Trinitarian theology, that's the result. But if you go the other direction that I was doing and she is um, from uh, start with the Holy Spirit, who is God with us, within us, around the earth, within each living creature, the giver of life, the vivifier and work our way to the source, as Justin is saying, uh, calling through the word to the source, then you've got a whole different set of emphases to get put on, right? So I think um, the, the perichoresis that Koto was bringing forward is key to this whole thing, definitely. Because there is no hierarchy in the perichoresis. It's the, it's the interaction, the interrelation, the dancing around together is the origin of that word in, in uh, choreography. Um, puts everything in motion, everything needed and different, but in unity, not not in hierarchy. So we're done with triangles when we in our Trinitarian classes, huh? We're done with pyramids, <laughs> triangle. Go for the circle. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, uh, Larry Kaufman, um, it's good to see you. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself, please, and you can bring us home with the final question. Can you hear me? Hundred yes. percent. I got well. to tell. I got to tell a story about Beth that illustrates the perichoresis. When Beth was here during the winter school in 1987, and I took her with me to the little outstation of Anschlossana outside Howick, and after the mass, which was in Zulu with a lot of singing people came outside and started dancing in a circle outside the church and beth was outside of the circle with her nikon camera taking pictures of the people dancing in a circle until one of the mamas went up and said no 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 sissy you don't stand outside the circle you come in, we'll show you how it's done. And they drew her right into the circle. And for me, that's the most wonderful image of the Trinitarian perichoresis. We're not bystanders. The Trinity draws us in to the dance. Larry, thank you for that memory. And I still have that picture that I took, nevertheless. <laughs> no, but you're so right. It's so good to see you, Larry. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, um, everybody, this is... I, I, I think... Oh, go right ahead. I, I, thank you, Justin. I, I think I agree. I agree with Larry. Uh, because that's, what, that's exactly what Christopher West says. He says, there is the father who is God, who begets the son, and the son who is begotten by the son, by the father, who receives the love of the father and eternally gives himself back to the father. However, 
there's this ever shared, ever spiraling love, which is the Holy Spirit, right. which completes right. this circle. As Larry was saying, the circle right. was incomplete right. without birth. Jesus. It had to be completed. So the Trinity is enfolding. It enf The Trinity says we need to enfold all of us and not say this one's role is different from ours. They are taking photos. We are dancing. We are all dancers. Right. Oh, that's, that's extremely lovely. Uh, so this has been an amazing day. Uh, amazing evening, day for you, I guess, <laughs> Sister Elizabeth Johnson. As you can tell, uh, we have some people who are having to drop up because load shedding is starting, so we're going to have to wrap up here. Um, but um, thank you so much um, for um, answering an email. That's where this really just started. I, it's like, you know, I want to get her to hear because my students love her work. I'll just send an email and see what happens. So thank you for answering that email. Thank you for being a part of our community and for coming back to South Africa, albeit virtually. If you are up to flying, you're always welcome here. You always have a home. So thank you so much. Uh, we thank deeply you. appreciate your time and your energy and your effort. And we will definitely continue the conversation further, maybe a way to engage your text in some fashion. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Beth. Thank you very much for the invitation and to be, being part of this and uh, yeah was yeah thank was you. deep thank you mm. okay everybody so this is the end thank you again i hope that you have a a, um, a great dinner and if you have load shedding i hope it lasts uh, for stage one and not uh, not for four hours <laughs> <laughs> take care everyone thank you thank you justin care, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you, sir. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you god Thanks. bless you Thanks, all Elizabeth. we involve you Sister Judith. Hi, Kurzum. <laughs>